Welcome to Corinth Christian Church Online. My name is Josh, one of the ministers here at Corinth, and I want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us today for church. We're delighted you prioritized what matters most during this busy holiday season. If you're newer with us, we want to invite you to Corinth.cc. It's a, it's a resource for you that will help you feel like you're part of the family and plugged in right away. You can also submit a prayer request or you'll see an I'm new button. We'd love to connect with you. And if you fill out that short form, we also want to send you a gift in the mail. Just a way for us to say thanks for joining us today. We'll be here for about an hour. We'll sing a couple songs. And Adam Turner, our senior minister, will continue part two of our Christmas series, Witness His Majesty. See, in the busy Christmas season, we don't want to rush past and miss Jesus. We want to witness His Majesty. So we're excited you're with us. And if you're ready to jump in, so are we. Let's worship together now. Stand together this morning. Let's sing praise to our Savior. Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, it's nice to have you here with us today. I'm so glad and grateful that you have decided to come worship with us this morning. If you're in the room, it's nice to see you. And if you're tuning in online, we are glad 
to have you with us. Hey, so one of the things that we try to do really well is make connection easy for all of you, and we try to make that so that it can happen right away, and that's why we have Corinth.cc. That's a great place. It's a great resource for you to connect with us. You'll be able to uh, follow along with today's sermon at Corinth.cc, maybe even take some sermon notes and have them emailed back to yourself. You can learn more about upcoming events or ministries, uh, all sorts of different things. And then you can connect with us by telling us a little bit about yourself. And in fact, if you're a guest with us today here at Corinth, I just want to say this. I'm so glad that you are here. And uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come be with us. We would love to connect with you. And so we want to encourage you to take advantage of Corinth.cc and find that icon that says I'm new. Whether you're online or in the room, tell us a little bit about yourself because we want to give you a gift, uh, whether in the mail or in person today over at our guest services kiosk across the hall. Um, Also, uh, last week, we told you guys a little bit about these connection cards right here. And we we introduced these. They're in your bulletins. And... uh, it's a great way to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself or to vote on a poll or to tell us how we can be praying for you or to even say, I need to take a next step in my faith and that is going to be this. And we'd love to keep pulling those out each and every week. So if you'll do that right now, go ahead and do that and fill out that front part right there. Uh, if you've been with us for years, you can just write your name and email. But if you are newer with us, we would love to invite you to fill out as much as you're comfortable with so that we can be connecting with you. Because again, we want to make connection easy right away. Now, um, I'm sure you guys want to know the results of the poll that we voted on last week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got to be a lot lot more excited about this. You want to like, this is exciting stuff. You want to know the results of the poll from last week? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Perfect. We, we asked you guys, what is the best Christmas tree? And the options were artificial or real. And it was a close race. In fact, the winner won by just one vote, a single vote, just a single vote. And, uh, and the answer is, got a little bit of a drum roll, uh, artificial. Artificial won. That is the result. Hopefully, hopefully we can all be happy with that and civil with each other. If not, we might have to get you to sign a peace tree, T. It's bad, isn't it? Hey, uh, hey, we want to we wanna keep having fun uh, with these cards uh, each week. And so this week, there's a little bit of a poll right here called, What is the Best Christmas Movie? We want to encourage you to go ahead and tell us what you think, and we'll let you know the results there next week. Also on this card, you'll be able to tell us um, how we can be praying for you. This last Tuesday, we did circle up as a staff, and we, we prayed over all of these uh, cards that came in. It's our great joy to do that. So please, let us know how we can be lifting you and your situations up Uh, this week as we circle up as a staff to do that. Uh, You also have the opportunity to just declare to us what a next step is that you're going to take. Maybe it's going to be to begin a relationship with Jesus or to attend a next steps event, or maybe it's going to be to invite someone to a Christmas Eve service. There are next steps that you can take that we would love to hear about so that we can uh, follow up with you there. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and fill out my card right now. Uh, My name is Luke Sayer, so I'm going to write down Luke Sayer here, and uh, I'm super excited because I actually get to check off the box married. (laughs) Pumped about that, yeah. And then on the back, um, my favorite Christmas movie, I'm going to write in an option for other, and it's going to be Elf. That's the best Christmas movie. There you go. And then I know that my next step is to invite a friend to Christmas Eve, so that's going to be my next step. And because that's my next step, I have uh, this little handy-dandy Christmas Eve invite card, and Uh, What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this along to someone this week and invite them to come to Christmas Eve. There are tons of these out in the concourse, and I hope that if your next step is to do that, that you'll grab a few of these and join me as well. That means I'm done with my connection card, so at the end of the service, on my way out the door, I'm going to drop it off with an usher, and you can do the same with yours. We hope that you'll take advantage of this great resource so that we can continue to stay connected with all of you. You. Hey, um, a lot of great things coming up. The Christmas Eve, I mentioned, we've got services here at 2.30, at 4, and at 5.30, as well as a traditional service in the sanctuary at 5. We got a lot of great stuff happening that day, so we want to invite you to come on out. We'd love to have you join us. Would you do us a favor, though? Go to the Church Center app and go ahead and tell us which service you are going to come to. That way, we are able to best plan ahead for for that day. It's going to be a great, great day. Also, a lot of fun Christmas stuff coming up this week. Middle schoolers are having a party tonight at 5. 
high schoolers Wednesday at 6. And then next week, our kiddos are invited to come to church in their pajamas. Now, a lot of you are like, it's a miracle they don't make it to church in their pajamas every week. But especially, they are invited to join us in their pajamas uh, next week because we're having a Christmas pajama party for all of our kiddos You'll, you'll want to make sure they come out for a lot of fun treats, a lot of fun activities. And maybe you're watching online, you've got some kiddos there with you. Next week would be a great week to come on out and join us in person so they don't miss out on any of that fun. Uh, today, we're continuing our Christmas sermon series called Witness His Majesty. And Adam Turner is going to come up here in a little bit. He's our senior minister, and he's going to continue to walk us through Uh, the Christmas narrative. I know you're going to be blessed by that. But before we move on in our service, we actually just, we need to stop and uh, and we need to pray. Uh, This last weekend, a giant tornado uh, ripped through the Midwest. Uh, Kentucky got hit big, Arkansas, Illinois. A lot of people are saying this, this is one of the worst tornadoes we've seen in a long time. And they're fearful that uh, as of right now, over 100 have lost their lives. Many people have lost their, their businesses and, and their homes. And so we know that as a church right now, what we can be doing is to pray and come alongside of our brothers and sisters and lift them up uh, that they would be able to see hope in a time of despair. And it's our, our request that you continue to pray beyond this moment, but we are especially going to take this moment to do just that. So we bow our heads and we'll pray and then we will worship. God, you are good. And even when hard things happen, and even when confusing things happen, that does not change. You are good. You always have been. You always will be. And we are grateful for your grace. God, we we request your help, your presence for those who are grieving a loss. It's hard enough already as it is, but it makes it even harder that it was a tragedy and this close to Christmas, God. So we we just ask that you would be close to those who are grieving the loss of someone because of this tornado. God, for those who have lost their homes, their businesses, man, how can they not be experiencing moments of despair? We pray that you would do what only you can do, which is to bring hope in the midst of darkness, to bring joy in the midst of grief. God, we pray that as a church, we would be able to continue to to lift our brothers and sisters up in the Midwest before you. We pray that we would look for opportunities to, to serve and to help and to be generous as people begin to rebuild. You are a good God, and we are grateful for you. Uh, This morning, as we gather together and we worship, we pray that you would be honored and glorified by what you hear. We pray that you would do a work within us and that you would would send your Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we would begin to be transformed more and more into your likeness. Today, as the gospel is proclaimed and preached, we pray that we would have the ears to receive again so that we would be transformed. We are grateful for your grace. We're grateful for your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Certain 
pray together this morning. Jesus, we come to you today, and we're grateful that you came. We're grateful like we just sang that you set aside heaven's glories, that you came and that you were born among us, that you came to save us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are a king, a God who is present, that you come today when we call, when we need you, that you're actively working on our behalf. We thank you that you are here and present. And we thank you, King Jesus, that the day is coming when you will come again and when you will return. And until that day, we long uh, for your coming. We come uh, today with hearts expectant to hear from you. And as we come to this time of communion, we want to honor you well. So please come, our King, and speak to us today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, one of the things that we love here at Corinth Christian Church is whenever uh, we take next steps that often involve incredible generosity. And uh, around the Christmas season, one of the ways that we often do that is uh, through Operation Christmas Child. We encourage you to grab a box, pack a box with gifts, and then that box gets sent out all over the world to to children who, if not for the box that you packed, wouldn't have received a Christmas gift at all. And uh, man, I want to just share with you uh, what Corinth was able to do this year. We were able to send off just shy of 500 boxes. 487 was our total. And I just want to thank you for your generosity in that. We can clap for that. That's good news. Yeah, like 487 boxes. You know, that means that you have to do over 500 next season. So you ready for that? Man, it's just so cool to see that happen. I am so encouraged to know that the gospel is being presented to generations all across the nations. And uh, here's the thing. Uh, we, we were able to take a group of teenagers uh, last night uh, to the processing center, and we were preparing those boxes to be sent off all over the world. And we learned that Atlanta's processing center alone has already prepared over 1.3 million boxes to be sent with plans to reach 1.6 or even higher. That's just Atlanta's. There are six other processing centers. Guys, the gospel is going to the ends of the earth. This is good news. But the, the, but the boxes are full of what, are, what we would say are free gifts for children this year. But the main gift that's being presented is the same gift that's presented to you and to I each and every day. And that's the gift of Jesus. The most significant part of the Christmas story is not the angels appearing. It's not Mary conceiving. It's not the shepherds uh, proclaiming or the wise men searching. It's not the eight maids of milking or the seven swans of swimming. The most significant part of the Christmas story is that the gift of Jesus is for us. And each week as we gather together to take communion, Christmas time or not Christmas time, we are given the chance to worship and to be reminded that there is a free gift for us. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This morning I want to invite you to, to worship because God has made a gift available to us, and together we will be reminded of how that gift was made available through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so together we'll take the bread... And we'll be reminded that this is Jesus' body broken for you and for me. In the same way, we'll take the cup and we'll be reminded that this is the cup of the new covenant. Oh, Father, we are so grateful. We are moved to worship and to praise because of the great gift that you have extended to us. We did not deserve it, and yet you offered it anyway. Scripture does tell us that the wages of sin is death, and that's true. That's why Jesus died. And so we're we're grateful for the sacrifice that was made. We're grateful... Uh, for the grace that was extended. And we pray that as we receive it, we would begin to be transformed again and again to look just a little bit more like your son. God, in this time of communion, may we be moved to celebrate, moved to worship, moved to praise because of how generous you have been to us. We love you, our King. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Father God, we are grateful people today to be in your presence, grateful to know that unto us a Savior has been born, and that through Jesus our sins have been forgiven. We have experienced your your grace, we've experienced your, your mercy, we've experienced hope. And so Father, today we, we pray that you would infuse us with hope today. Would you please give hope to those who have walked in today feeling hopeless because of 
circumstances out of their own control. People who are feeling hopeless as they watch loved ones destroy their lives and run from you. Hope for those who are feeling hopeless and they don't even know it, but the reason they feel hopeless is because they're dead in their sins today. And they've never experienced the the grace that comes through your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. So please speak to us today and as we consider your earthly Father today, Lord Jesus. May our hearts and our eyes be drawn towards your heavenly Father and the great purpose he has for us, for us all in this room and in this place today. So give us ears to hear that which the Spirit would have us to hear this morning, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, mess with us today. And we pray this all in your powerful name. And church says, amen. And amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all here uh, today. Good to have you in the room. Uh, Good to have you watching online as well. If you're watching online, we want you to know we're really, really uh, pleased to have you tuned in this morning. Be sure to like and share, text message some folks, invite people to watch along with you, jump into the comments, and let's uh, let's stay involved today. Uh, If you're watching online, we would love to see you in person soon. Next Sunday be a great Sunday uh, to do that, and so we want to invite you to come join us in person. If you're in the room, uh, let's give a howdy to our online friends on the count of three. You guys ready? One, two, three. Howdy. Howdy, howdy. So it's good to have you all there. Um, it, online, in the room, I want to say thank you for your continued generosity. Uh, just the, the way that you continue to give and support what the Lord is doing here at Corinth Christian Church is amazing stuff. I want to remind you that last week we, we announced uh, the resuming of Four Generations 2.0 as we're looking to build an elementary building for elementary students. And uh, our desire is to pay cash for that building. And, you know, we are so close, so close. We're about $300,000 short of being able to pay cash for for that building. And so we believe with a super strong December, we're encouraging you all to do big give December uh, towards uh, Four Generations 2.0 um, or making a, a 12-month commitment for the year 2022. Um, we believe we can do that. So we're excited, excited, excited uh, to get that ball rolling there. So if you're online, you can do that. If you're in the room, you can do that as well. And uh, today, I hope you guys got your connection card because we believe the Lord is going to say something to us today. So um, be just uh, ready to hear what it is the Lord has in store for you. So uh, start with this. Um, I don't know at what point it is in our lives, but there comes a moment in life uh, whenever we become self-aware. And I'm not talking about the fear that we have about all these robots that they keep creating that can jump and do backflips like nobody's ever seen Terminator, you know. It's, I'm not talking about like self-aware, like that kind of stuff, but there comes a moment in our lives whenever we begin to realize that, hey, people think about me. People have opinions about me, and so we begin to start to think about what do people think about me. You know, we just become self-aware to it, and probably generally for the most part, um, I think it generally happens for us the moment that hormones start coursing through our veins, you know, and we start to notice the opposite sex, and it's like, okay, time to start brushing the teeth, time to start take, you know, wearing deodorant, time to shower at least twice a week, you know, kind of things like that, and it's just like we start to think about the clothes that we wear and how we smell and all the things that are there, and so I- I'm just wondering, online in the room, how many of y'all are willing to admit Okay, you are willing to admit that you can find yourself being too concerned with what other people think about you. Raise your hand if that is you. Okay, and if you're not raising your hand, I'm going to assume that is because you are too concerned with what other people think about you. Okay, I ain't raising my hand. No, what are people going to think? You know, um, so but it happens to us all. We just get to this place to where we're just you know self aware of what's going. on. That's not a bad thing. You know, it's okay to be going, you know what, I should probably shower because of the way other people, you know, react around me. It's not a bad thing to be going, you know what, I don't want to have, you know, chunks of things in my teeth as I go talk to somebody. You know, that's not a bad thing. You know, it's not a bad thing to say, you know what, I probably shouldn't say that because it might offend someone. That's not a bad thing. It's okay. Hey, hear this. This might be the word some of y'all need to hear. It's okay to have an unexpressed thought, okay? It's okay. Just because you think it doesn't mean you got to say it. So it's okay to think about, well, how would this affect other people? But the problem is, is that sometimes it can, if we're obsessed with it, it can keep us from doing good things. 
You know, it, it can keep us from, you know, taking a, a risk that we really need to take. You know, it can keep you from asking her out. It can keep you from, you know, stepping out and starting that business that you've dream, dreamt about your entire life. You know, it can keep you from taking, you know, good, healthy risks out there because you're just like, ah, but, but, but what, what will people think if I try that and it doesn't work, you know? Um, it can also, it can lead us into bad it can lead us to doing some of the stupidest things that we've ever done in our life. In fact, I'm willing to bet that the worst decisions that you have ever made in your life were done in the company of people you cared about what they thought about you. Okay? Very rarely do we get in trouble on our own. Most of the time, it's in the company of people that we're, 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 we're concerned about what they think. And so that causes us to, to give in to the peer pressure. That causes us to follow the crowd. crowd causes us to make big mistakes. It can also lead us to making, you know, just like all these kind of decisions. We, so we, we begin obsessing about what people think about us. And so we, we worry about, you know, the clothes that we wear, the car that we're driving. You know, we, we, per, we post the perfect Instagram post and it only gets two likes, you know, one from your mom and one from your grandma. You know, and you're just like, oh my goodness, my life is over. Why? Because we're so consumed with what other people think because we want to fit in. It's just natural. That's human behavior. It's natural. We want to fit in. We want to be accepted. And so that can cause us to care, to care too much about what other people think about us. And really, it rolls right into your faith as well. Whenever we're so obsessed, we're so concerned with what other people think about us, it can keep us from living out the life of faith that the Lord is calling us to live. It can keep us closed in because we're too scared of what other people might think about us. They might call us a fanatic. They might call us a freak. They might think that we're just like this obsessed, sold-out person. Like that would be a bad thing, you know? And so we just worry about it and worry about it. And it keeps us from the life that God has in store for us. And today, as we, we move into week two of um, our series called Witness His Majesty, our Christmas series, where we are looking at the Christmas story through the eyes of the witnesses that were there at the very first time, uh, at the very first Christmas, we're going to look at the story today through the, through the eyes of a guy who, if he would have been overly concerned with what people thought about him, then the Christmas story would be very, very different than the way it actually turned out. His name is Joseph. Um, he is Jesus's earthly father. So we, we don't know a lot about the guy. Oh, his story is in Matthew chapter one. So if you got a Bible, I'd invite you to go ahead and, and flip over there. And uh, we're gonna look at, look at Joseph's life here. But um, what do we know about Joseph? It, it's just not a lot. Here, here's what we know about Joseph. Joseph was a good dude. Everybody say good dude. Good dude. That's who Joseph was. He was a good dude. He swung a hammer for a living. He was a carpenter. Um, he, so he, he's just a good guy. He's an upstanding guy. Um, he's older than Mary. We, we don't know how much older than Mary he is. Maybe three years, maybe as many as 15 years. Okay, that's just the way it was back then. Um, but he's betrothed to her, which means he's engaged, but it's actually a step past engagement. So like engagement is what we think of, then betrothed, it's a step between actually getting you know engaged and getting married and it's like it's more serious to the point to where if you wanted out of a betrothal you'd actually have to like do a certificate of divorce kind of thing okay but they haven't consummated the, the marriage or anything like that and so that's that's who he is joseph is just a he's a good dude um, in fact here's if, if you want to picture joseph picture this he wears khakis and a polo okay He's got khakis and a polo on. If he shows up to date your daughter, he's going to shake your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. He's going to ask what time she needs to be back, and then they'll be back an hour before that, okay? So that's Joseph right there. He's, just a, he's a good, upstanding kind of guy, okay? That, that's who he is. So th this is what Matthew tells us about him. He says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was, was pledged to be married to Joseph. So here's our good dude, righteous guy, right? But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, so before they're married, before they've consummated the, the marriage, any of those kind of things, um, it's, it fi they find out that Mary is pregnant. Okay, So I, I just want you to imagine the scene. All right, So we've got Joseph in his khakis and his polo, and he's talking to his, his young fiance, and she comes to him and says, Hey, Joe, we need to talk. I got good news, and I got bad news. Okay? So um, the bad news is this. I'm pregnant, even though we're not married yet. 
And uh, the good news, though, is this. Um, I haven't been with any, anybody else, okay? Um, an angel came to me and said, Hail Mary, full of grace, all right? And Hail Mary, full of grace, and I'm going to have a miracle baby, and all the generations are going to call me blessed after this. I know it's never happened before, but you got to trust me on this one. So what is Joseph feeling in the moment? Slide yourself into his sandals, you know, and just think about this for for just a second. How is Joseph feeling? I think that there's probably one predominant emotion that the guy's feeling at the moment. You want to know what it is? Anger. He's furious. I mean, he is looking at this young, sweet girl that he loves, wants to spend the rest of his life with, and he's looking at her, and he's thinking to himself, this girl is either a liar or she's a lunatic. She's lost her ever-loving mind. I am engaged and about to be married to a pathological liar or just somebody who needs to go to the funny farm kind of person. Okay, he's just furious. I mean, he's thinking about all of this and because he's going to start to think, he's like, oh my goodness, my entire life I have worked to build and to establish my reputation and now it's all just, it's at stake. Everything is about to just be thrown away. My entire reputation is about to be destroyed because what are other people going to think about this? What are other people going to say about this? I mean, really, there's only two options for what people are going to think about Joseph, right? He's either guilty or he's gullible. He's the one guy in the world who bought the, yeah, I'm pregnant through the Holy Spirit bit. You know, he's the one guy that fell for it. And so people are like, this dude, he either did it or he's gullible, you know, because he's buying that, you know, this is actually from God and that she wasn't just running around on him. He's like, everything is about to just fall apart. So what is a guy to do with this information? Well, Matthew tells us, verse 19, he says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So let me ask you a very easy question, all right? You guys ready? Let's get this question right. Does Joseph, at this point, does he believe Mary's story? No, not one bit, right? He's like, yeah, I don't buy it. I don't buy the Hail Mary full of grace kind of thing. I don't buy any of that. So what does he say? Well, I'm just going to have to to end this. Now, he's a good guy, right? Remember, he's a good dude. He's a good dude. We already said it. He's a good dude. He's like, I I don't want Mary to be like, you know, disgraced, you know, even worse. I mean, according to the law, I mean, she could actually be executed for this. Not that they really did that a lot back then. But he's like, I don't want anything to happen to her. I mean, he's like, I'm a righteous guy. I obey the commandments. I honor the Sabbath. I don't eat unclean foods. I'm upright in business. I do all the things that are right. And he's this righteous guy who now has an unrighteous problem. What do I do? What do I want to do? Well, he's like, I want to save face. And I want to save Mary. All at the same time. So I'll just divorce her quietly. Yeah, she's probably going to have to go live with Aunt Elizabeth for a while. Gonna have to raise that kid all by herself. And yeah, that's probably gonna wreck her, her life, but hopefully she can go to another area and just start over. And that's probably what I'm gonna have to do as well, is I'm gonna have to uproot my business and go to some surrounding area and just try to rebuild everything so I can just get the stink of this away from me. He's like, but, but I don't want anything bad to happen to her. I just want us both to have a new life. But Joseph is about to learn a huge lesson here. One of the most important lessons that that you you can learn, okay? So I I just want you to hear this. This is a lesson Joseph is about to learn. He's about to learn that pleasing God may mean disappointing people. When you choose to please him, you may have to disappoint other people in your life. Verse 20, it says, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people 
from their sins. So what does the angel say unto Joseph? Joseph, she ain't lying, all right? She's telling you the truth. It was Hail Mary full of grace. This is of God. This is of the Spirit's working. So do not be afraid, okay? He shows up in a dream to Joseph. You, you, you might not know this, but in the New Testament, there are only five instances of somebody having a dream, okay, where God shows up to him in a dream, okay? Three of them go to Joseph, Okay? Because that's how hard this story is for Joseph. Okay? He's like, God's got to speak to me or something. And so the Lord's like, I'll show up. I'll get you through this. All right? But three of those five dreams are, are straight to Joseph. And the angel is just confirming the story. He's like, don't miss out. Don't miss out. This thing that you have been waiting for for years, Joseph, you have been praying for years. Your daddy prayed for this. Your grandpa prayed for this. Your great-grandpa prayed for this. Your great-great-grandpa prayed for this. That one day that they would see the Messiah of God come into the earth and set things right. Joseph, do not be afraid because you are going to have a front row seat to God setting things to right, to God setting the course of history, to God saving his people apart from their sins. Joseph, you have a role to play in this story along with your wife, Mary. Are you in or are you out? Are you willing to put your reputation on the line so that you can be a part of the story that God has for all of humanity? Are you willing to risk your reputation? Are you willing to endure all the rumors so that the Lord's plan for all humanity will unfold? Now, I, I want to hit the pause button for just a second because... I think that we've heard the Christmas story so often that we throw this into a Christmas pageant and we're picturing a guy in a bathrobe with the belt tied around his head like a headband, you know, and some like eight-year-old standing up there and we're just thinking, oh, this is such a cute little story. No, this isn't a cute little story. This happened. He felt everything that you can even begin to imagine, the fear, the trepidation, all the things are there. The struggle was there. Can you imagine how easy it would have been in that moment for Joseph to just go, you don't know how much this is going to cost me. Do you know what I'm about to lose if I say yes to this? But here's the thing. By faith, Joseph chose to focus on the call, not his fears. He focused on what God was asking him to do, not concerned as much with what other people are going to, to think. He, fo he chose to focus on the call, not his reputation. And he chose... To please the Lord and not protect his own life. You know, I, I've heard it said, and we'll put this on the screen. I think this is just so good. If we focus on what others think about us, we'll forget what God thinks about us. But if we focus on what God thinks about us, we'll forget what others think about us. Let me say that again. This is just so key. This is, this is the key to understanding where Joseph is. This is the key to unlocking how we move forward. If we focus on what others think about us, you will forget what God thinks about you. But if you focus on what God thinks about you, you will forget and you won't care what others think about you. And so Joseph chose to focus on what the Lord was calling him to do. And this is our call today. Will we decide, will you decide, will we as individuals, will we as a church, will we decide to focus on pleasing God over men? Will we choose to follow his call no matter what it costs us? Because we believe that his call in our life is that important. And if you choose to do that, I have two important reminders for you today. Reminder number one is this. Remember, obeying God may lead to criticism from people. When you choose to obey God, 
it very may, very may well lead to criticism from people. I mean, I just want you to imagine what Mary and Joseph endured. I don't know if anybody in the room or if anybody watching online, if you can imagine growing up in a small rural country community. Can anybody in the room imagine what it is like growing up in a small country rural community where everybody know everybody, everybody know mom and them, okay? Everybody know everybody's business. Everybody know everything's going on. Can anybody in the room... Can you sympathize with that? Can you empathize with that? Okay, yeah, we all do. That's called Walton County, right? It's like everybody knows everything are, are, are around here. Well, that's Mary and Joseph. They, 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 do, they grow up in this small little country hip town. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody's business. And even though these people are unsophisticated people, they can still do math. And they know that whenever you get married in January and you have a baby in March, that that's not how things normally go. They're counting on their fingers. They're going, wait a second. That's the quickest pregnancy I've ever heard of around here. And they're going, ah, ha, ha, ha. I'm guessing something funny's going on here. People are skeptical. They're hearing this story. Well, an angel appeared to Mary. It's like, yeah, I bet it was an angel. Yeah, uh-huh. Maybe a guy named Angel or something like that. You know, it's like... I, it's like, no, 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 no. But Joseph makes the choice. I, I just consider everything he's, he's likely to lose. He, he's likely to lose friends. I mean, there's no more invitations over to play cards. You know, no more brisket and card nights. You know, there's none of that going on. You know, he, he's likely to lose business partners because there's people like, I'm not going to be associated with a guy that's, you know, got a, got a, a child out of wedlock in that society. I, I'm not going to do that. His admiration, this idea that he is a righteous dude, you know, he's just a good man, that's gone. It's all on the line. He's losing that. Saying yes to this baby would come at an enormous sacrifice for Joseph. And just in case you think I'm making this up, this is what it cost Joseph his reputation. We, we know this. There's actually a clue in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, whenever they're talking about Joseph, uh, Jesus, he's in a town, and this is how they refer to Jesus. They say, isn't this Jesus the son of Mary? Now, normally, even if the dad's dead, Joseph is probably dead at that point, okay? But even if the dad is dead, he would still be referred to as the son of Joseph. Like, if, if my dad was, was not, you know, still alive, I would still be referred to as the son of Larry. It wouldn't matter. They wouldn't shift it to my mama just because she's still alive. So by doing this, they are making a very um, pointed, uh, dis, uh, uh, oh gosh, what's the word? A very pointed phrase at him. They're using, it's a very disgusting phrase, actually. Um, we have phrases that we would use. We just wouldn't use them in church, okay? And um, honestly, if you wouldn't use it in church, you probably shouldn't use it outside of church either. We'll just throw that out there. But anyway, so it's a, it's a son of kind of thing. It's the same kind of beginning of the phrase, all right? And that's what they're saying about Jesus there. He's son of, and it wouldn't be Mary. So they, they are completely, completely dissing Joseph. Obeying God may lead to criticism from people. Saying yes to Jesus will probably cost you something. I mean, I think about the disciples after they, you know, resurrection and they're going around after Easter and they're, they're preaching the gospel, telling people that, you know, Jesus came, he lived, he died, he, buried, he was buried, third day he raised again. And he, he, he did this to save the sins of the world. And what did they get? They were beaten, they were arrested, all of them were executed. The Apostle Paul, you know, he comes to faith a little bit later, and so he's starting to, you know, uh, plant churches, tell people about Jesus, and what does he get? Well, he says, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was pelted with stones. He was in prison. He lived under scrutiny his entire life till he was executed. Saying yes to Jesus will cost you. And obeying God may lead to criticism from people. You know, like whenever you leave your high-paying career or your big-paying job because you feel like the Lord is calling you to do something else in life, people are going to go, what's wrong with you? Why are you abandoning, you know, providing for your family like that? Whenever you leave scholarship money on the table to go and pursue Bible college because you believe the Lord is calling you into mission work or to ministry, people are going to criticize you and say, how can you leave that much money on the table? You know, whenever you move away from home to follow God's call on your life for school or a career, whenever you decide that you're going to foster children and provide a home for those who need it, whenever you decide that you're going to stay pure in your relationship, 
relationships, that you're not going to have any hint of sexual immorality among you. Whenever you decide that you're going to live with less so that you can give more, whenever you forgive those who have wronged you, when you make those decisions, friends, I promise you, you're probably going to get some criticism. Whenever you choose to obey God, it's going to cost you something. But here's the kicker. The cost of not obeying is greater. The cost of not following the Lord's call on your life is greater. Because then you're forfeiting peace and purpose, grace and mercy and assurance. It's going to cost you something. So be ready for the criticism. Be be ready for the criticism. Be, Be ready for it. Because nothing worth doing is easy. Nothing worth doing is easy. Here's the second thing I want to remind you of today. You don't have to understand to obey. You don't have to understand to obey. Can I get the moms and dads in the room to say amen? Amen. 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 Why do I have to do that? You don't have to understand to obey. Just obey, right? Right? But that's what it is. Understanding can wait. Obedience cannot. Understanding can wait. Obedience cannot wait. And that one ordinary act of obedience can lead to extraordinary results in your life and in the lives of others. Joseph and Mary, they said yes. Did they understand everything? No. Now, did Mary know? Yes. Okay, she knew. But did they understand everything? No. But obedience trumps understanding. And their obedience changed the course of human history. You don't have to know the details to obey. You just obey and you trust him with the outcome. That's what you're called to do. You just say yes and you have no idea what will be set in motion. When we simply obey and trust the Lord for the outcome. Now, if if you've been around here, you've probably heard me share parts of my story before. But the the short of it is is this. You know, I grew up uh, going to church. You know, mom and dad made sure that we were in church all the time. Um, You know, all those things. And but. I only went to church until about sixth grade or so because some things in the home kind of got a little hairy. And so we just kind of stopped going to church. And so I did not go to church from seventh grade all the way up till right before my senior year of high school, okay? Which was really funny because then I became a youth minister later. And so I was doing youth ministry and they'd be like, you don't even know what a youth group is supposed to be like. And I'd be like, you're right. I was never a part of one, okay? And so this is my interpretation of what it should be. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, so from 7th to 12th grade, you know, um, never really went to church. But in my life, I had these friends who were consistent inviters to me. I, you know, a, a guy named Kyle. Kyle invited me to go to Sunday school at First Christian Church in Carthage all the time. And I would go every once in a while, you know. My buddy Brian, he would be like, hey, 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 uh, youth group, we're going to go, uh, we're going to play paintball together. You want to go play paintball? I, lo- I would love to shoot somebody with a paintball. Yeah, let's go do that, you know. Or, or then in Missouri, we had this thing where we go to the barn swings. I don't know if you guys have ever been to a barn swing or not. It's a barn with a swing in it. It's really complicated, okay. Um, but, you know, it's like, we're going to the barn swings. Do you want to go with that and do that? Uh, the, the, the youth minister... Uh, During that that time, uh, his name was Jeff Johnson, and and Jeff um, spiritually stalked me. That's what he described it as. I was a spiritual stalker. And so, you know, he would show up at my games. You know, he would show up if I was shooting baskets out in the front yard. He would just show up everywhere, and these people were consistently inviting, inviting, even though often I was ignoring, 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 turning down. They were persistent, and they were obedient. They kept asking. And then finally, there towards the, the, uh, the end of uh, my, my, the summer after my junior year, one of them invited me to this big rally that was going on in Carthage at my hometown, and they came up with a fantastic name for it. You guys ready? It was called Carthage for Jesus. You know, the creativity was off the charts, all right? But they invited me to it, and they're like, hey, we're bringing in Mike Singletary to to preach. Now, if you're older like me or something, you remember who Mike Singletary is, 1985 Bears middle linebacker, just just a bad, bad dude on the football field, but a man of God. And so he was the one that was preaching, and that invite got me to Carthage for Jesus, which led me to hearing Mike Singletary speaking, which was where the Holy Spirit used to say, Turner, what are you doing You realize that is what set my life back on 
course of following Jesus, that the way my life has turned out now never would have happened if I didn't have three or four people in my life who were consistently being obedient to the call of Jesus of just reaching out to somebody who needed reaching out to? Did they have a clue that just inviting me to go to a Sunday school class or inviting me to go shoot paintballs, to go do barn swings or go to a rally to where maybe I thought I could meet a girl, you know, kind of thing? Um, you know, did they have a clue what the Lord was going to do in my life? No. Did a high school student who extended that invitation to me to go to Carthage for Jesus, did they know that they were setting up the Holy Spirit to use Mike Singletary to preach a word from the Lord to me? No. You have zero idea how one small act of obedience can change the course of one person's life. You got no clue. And you don't have to understand and go, well, what happens if I do this? Is this going to lead to this? Is it going to do that? No, 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 no. That's not for you to worry about. You worry about being obedient. You, be, you worry about being obedient and you take that step. And so you, listen, you extend the invite to someone. Just, just do it. You're like, well, I don't know if they're going to say yes. Well, you don't know that they're going to say no. And if they say no, what's the, I mean, seriously, what's the, what's the big deal, right? So just ask them again. And then you ask them again. Here you go. You have the perfect opportunity to invite someone, right? We have Christmas Eve services coming up on Christmas Eve. If you're a parent, you tell your kid, I really want you to come you know, to Christmas Eve with me. If your kid's not, not in faith, if they're outside of church, whatever, say, I want you to come celebrate Christmas with us. If you're a grandparent, um, you get to do the same thing with your grandkids. And here's the thing. You can even do, do this. Just hold their presents hostage. And you just say, if you want presents from me, you're going to come to Christmas Eve with me, right? But no, you extend the invite, and you do that. You know, maybe it's just serving, and maybe it's just like, you know what, I'm just kind of sitting around. I'm a consumer. I'm not a contributor. And it's just like, you know what, there's a new year coming up. It's time for me, you know, to get off the bench, get in the game, and start serving. Like, I can do an hour a week, or I can do two hours a month, or whatever it is. And you just say, you know what, it's time for me to start doing something for somebody else. You know, maybe it's, you know, to start giving. Maybe you've never started tithing. You know, you've never tried that. And it's like, you know what? It's time for me to jump in and start supporting the church, you know, that is helping me to grow in my faith. And I'm just going to trust God with the rest. Maybe it's, you know, jumping into a group. You know, and just saying, you no, know, it's time for me to get into a group and to stop being isolated, and I'm going to get in. Maybe you've been in a group, and you know that your, your group is swimming in the shallow end of the pool, and you're like, you know what? It's time for us to go. Let's get in the deep end. Right? And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the first one to go. I'm going to do a cannonball into the deep end, and I'm going to share some struggles that I'm going through. Because here's what I know. Whenever we only share our victories, we're in danger of becoming competitors. But it's whenever we share our struggles, that's when we become brothers and sisters. And say, I'm jumping in. I don't care if anybody else follows me. I'm going into the deep end of the pool. Here's what's been going on in my life. Maybe it's, you know, the step of obedience is that you need to remove a relationship from your life because of what you do when you're with them. And you know, there's some sort of like next step of obedience that's just sitting right out there for you. And you're like, well, I just don't see how that's going to make a difference. You don't have to see how it's going to make a difference. Just obey. Be obedient. You don't have to understand to obey. You just obey and you trust him with the rest. That's exactly what Joseph did. Look at verse 24. It says, when Joseph woke up, so this is after the dream, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. He obeyed. Did his reputation take a hit? Yep. But his obedience led to something extraordinary. The greatest act in human history, God becoming like us, God in the flesh, God in the body, saving the world through Jesus Christ. It took place because Joseph and Mary said yes. 
You have no idea what one small step of obedience will lead to. So the bottom line this morning is this. My obedience is more important than my reputation. It's more important than than your reputation. It doesn't matter what other people think about you. What matters is what the Lord thinks about you. Focus on that. And if you're going to do something great for God, you can expect criticism from people. So be ready for it, but don't obsess over it. Because obedience is more important than your reputation. Obey him and trust him. So here's my challenge to you this week. I just want you to identify your next step of obedience. Now's the time to grab that connection card. On the back of the connection card, we got all kinds of next steps that are there for you. You know, there are all kinds of things. Maybe for some of you, it's like, you know, I, I need, my next step is that I need to invite someone to Christmas Eve. And so you need to check that box and, you know, you need to turn that card in. Maybe it's like, you know, it's time for me to jump in and serve. It's time for me to jump into a group. It's time for me to start giving. It's time for me to remove a relationship from my life. Maybe the Lord is directing you to something else, okay? But here's the deal. Identify your next step of obedience. All right, and then here's the kicker. Then do it. Then actually do something with it. And take that step of obedience and see what the Lord will do. For Joseph, that act of obedience was a huge act of obedience. And it led to extraordinary results for all of us. Jesus himself made a choice to obey. He came down. He came down. He became like us to save us. And Philippians 2 tells us that he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that leads to extraordinary results for you and for me. And so today, maybe for some of you, your your next step is the very first step of surrender. Maybe you've never repented. You've never confessed of your sins. You've never experienced the blessing of baptism. Maybe you've never done any of that. And you're like, today is the day that I'm ready to step in and to say, I want to follow Jesus with everything that I have. If you're watching online, you can visit the website that's on the screen. Um, If you're in the room, this is whenever you will have a chance. At the end of the service, you can come up and talk to me. Or if you want, you can just check it on the card and put it in in the bucket as you're leaving. And we'll be in touch tomorrow, okay? But we can take that step today. Maybe for some of you, it's to, you need to recommit your, your life to Jesus because you've been living for yourself. And maybe you know this. You've known this for a long time. But your biggest fear is, well, what are people going to think that if I say, you know what, I'm going to mess up? What are people going to think, you know, if I admit that, you know, it's like, oh, I haven't been living right, that I'm, that, that, what if people think that if I actually admit that I'm wrong about something? Because here's the deal, on the outside, a lot of y'all look great, but I'm just throwing this out there. There's a lot of you on the outside, you look good, but on the inside, you're rotten. Because you're putting forth a, a wall, you're putting forth a performance But on the inside, you're dead. Why? Because you're disobedient. And it's killing you. You're rotten on the inside. And today, you can say, I'm ready to to, to start over again. And maybe that's the step that you need to take. You're like, but it's just, it's so scary. Listen, my friends, if you want Jesus in your life, it's going to take some bravery. It'll take some bravery to admit that you can't do this on your own. It may cost you, but not following him will cost you even more. So Jesus, today, would you please give us the courage to see these next steps and to step out in faith, obey you and follow you. Even though we don't understand everything you're asking us to do at the moment, just help us to take that next step, to be obedient, and to trust you with the results. God, maybe some of my friends are in here today and they've been walking with you, been following you, and they have experienced all kinds of criticism because of their faithfulness to you. Would you please assure them today that you are with them? Remind them to have no fear because greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world. Father, for some of us who are in the room today and on the outside, everybody thinks everything's fine, but on the inside, we're dying. Would you give them the courage to step forward today? Give them the courage to step forward today and say, Jesus, I I need you. 
more than anybody knows. And would you restore them and renew them? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were obedient to death. And that three days later, you rose again. And so may we walk out of here today in resurrection power, following you in obedience. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We hope, like always, that you were encouraged and that you were challenged. And we hope that this busy Christmas season, you will be able to witness the majesty of Jesus. So thanks again for joining and logging on today. We hope you have an incredible week. And remember, as always, you are loved, you're valued, and we hope to see you next week.